The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 years, the hardest sources, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoin talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Vlad from Bitcoin Takeover Magazine, Victoria Jones from Satoshi's Page, and Ben Ark from LN Bits. Hello all. And now, issue one. Arrested Samurai Wallet co-founder to be released on bail will contest charges. William Lonergan Hill, known as T-Dev, has been granted bail by the U.S. government. He's one of the two founders of Samurai Wallet, which developed a mixing feature that helped anonymize Bitcoin transactions, and they are now scheduled for court appearances in the coming weeks. Vlad, what do you think about the arrest of the Samurai Wallet founders, and that one of them, at least, is now out on bail? Well, one meme which I like to perpetuate on Twitter is that we make sacrifices to the altar of 100K, and privacy is part of the sacrifice that we made, because within one month we lost Samurai, and then we, we lost Wasabi. And to me, it's interesting that they followed the legal, legal procedure to be able to fight back. It's admirable. I was stuck in this battle between Samurai and Wasabi for a while. Each camp was calling each other the spooks, you know, the government agents trying to compromise everyone else's privacy. It turned out that they were both honest, which is strange, but it's nice. It's, it's just reassuring to see that people are on the right side and they're going to fight. And if I'm not mistaken, William Hill, AKA TDEV, used this defense and said that they don't arrest terrorists for using Apple laptops or something, MacBooks. And some protocols or software or hardware, they're just tools that they can be used for anyone. And there's nothing wrong with privacy. And I use CoinJoins whenever someone sends me a donation to my page because I don't want to spend the Bitcoins under their identity. Because I'm pretty much aware that a lot of them use exchanges. And if they send coins from exchanges to me, I don't want to spend them and I don't want the party receiving the transaction to assume that it's that person. I don't know who that is in the first place, so I don't want to take on that risk. So I would, I would rather take on the risk to receive Silk Road coins part of my stash. I don't know. It's just that money has to become fungible one way or the other. It's unfortunate that Bitcoin doesn't have more advanced privacy, even though there's a lot of research into better confidentiality, but it's a good start. And I'm happy that TDEV is out of jail. It was interesting, Vlad, the Samurai versus Wasabi debate ended horribly. Fans of both sides were unsatisfied as they both shut down. There really was no winner. Let's go to Victoria Jones. Your thoughts on the Samurai developer who's now out on bail. Uh, well, I'm not particularly familiar with uh, this specific case. Um, obviously, the debate uh, surrounds uh, privacy on Bitcoin in general. And I think it's just part of a continuous battle that we're involved in. Obviously, uh, many of us in the Bitcoin community are understand that privacy is important. Uh, my personal take on it is that it's important that we have transparency uh, with countries and companies, which is kind of a, a different point, but it's very important that individuals have privacy because in terms of our global community, it's the individuals who, who are vulnerable. Um, so it is really important to uh, have privacy at that level. Um, so obviously these were warriors fighting uh, for privacy. Obviously, you know, there may well be arguments about exactly how it's implemented. Um, um, but, you know, where one door closes, another one opens, you know, the, the Bitcoin developments, the Vic Bitcoin developers are now working on uh, a new technology called silent payments, uh, which one uh, mentioned last week, which is um, a privacy technology that's actually going to be incorporated in the wallets rather than just uh, the Bitcoin technology. So, you know, uh, all hope is not lost. There are always new ways in which... Um, you know, whatever we're trying to achieve on Bitcoin can be achieved. So, uh, yeah, interesting developments. Uh, ben Ark, the Bitcoin developers famously concentrated on scaling instead of privacy. Do you think they made a mistake? I mean, we, we need both. And as, as far as I can see, we need Bitcoin foremost to be fungible. And it can't be fungible if it's not private. And if we have some coins which are mixed, 
and dirty coins, and then some coins which are kind of clear net and have history. Um, it creates like an unfungible asset, which isn't really what we want with Bitcoin as money. But I think we'll get there, like Victoria was saying. Um, and it was just, an, this particular case was an example of hardening. It was interesting that, because I imagine if you were to ask Samurai or Wasabi a couple of years ago whether they could be, or whether they would be subject to regulation, they would say, oh, no, not at all. You know, our, our technology is so great, we're never going to get regulated, blah, blah, blah. Clearly they were. Um, and what was great about it was off the back of it, Wasabi closed down. And then a few weeks later came back, but using Nostra for um, the, what they call the coordinators mm -hmm. uh, for the mixing. And that means that they're now no longer able to be regulated in the way which they were before. Um, so it's a great hardening exercise and also just a great example of how Nostra can be used in new and innovative and interesting ways. Um, so an, an definitely an interesting case to, to, to watch uh, uh, unfold. And um, I'm just happy for the samurai guys because it must have been very scary for them to be uh, locked up. Yeah, and speaking of Wasabi, now they have this distributed coordination process. Basically, there used to be only one which belonged to the company that developed the wallet. Now you can find a lot of them on wasabiist.com, wasabiist.com. And you can see what fees they have and how many coin joints they had in the last 24 hours. And yeah, they use Noster to coordinate, basically, to index all of this data and relay it and be able to figure out, you know, the average user should not have much technical knowledge of how this works. All they have to do is just copy just a small part, an address, which they put into the configuration file of the wallet, and that's how you point your wallet to the coordinator. And I think Samurai, to come back to the initial topic, also tried something similar a couple of months before the devs got arrested. I don't think... I'm not going to explain why or express an opinion on why, but for some reason Wasabi became more popular among the community as opposed to Samurai. When Samurai developers were arrested, the project just stalled. It got shut down. There was nobody who picked it up and said, okay, we're the new Samurais. But with Wasabi, everyone wanted to run a coordinator because they understood there is a lot of money to be made. And there's one by BTC Pay Server, there's one by former contributors to the project, and I've had the new old developers who are still working on Wasabi and they still receive money from the coordinators to maintain the wallet as an open source project, not as a company. And it's going to be interesting in the next few years because they want to make payments available directly from CoinJoins and they also want to integrate some of that silent payments that Victoria mentioned. It's going to be a lot of fun, but I do hope that we get much better confidentiality. Wasabi is probably more popular because it's spicy. Moving on to the exit question, forced prediction, predict the future. The Samurai wallet developers developed software, software that the U.S. government claims enabled money laundering and other crimes. Will they be found guilty? Vlad. Of course not. Victoria. <laughs> I think they'll be found whatever the U.S. government wants them to find. Wants to find. <laughs> ben Our laws are, are that flexible. <laughs> I, I think they were in a, a sticky position because they, they did speak about it quite publicly, who their clients were, um, and that's very, very risky. And so we should all, I mean, whatever the, the verdict is, we should all take a note out, a, a less, or learn a lesson from that, that if you're building this software, which can be used for other stuff, don't talk about the other stuff. You're building it for the, you know, for the, the good, clear net use cases, not the other use cases. Um, but no, good luck to them. I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, good luck. I just wish them all the bad work luck in the world. The answer is guilty. The pitch deck will condemn them because the pitch deck says they'll make money through, like Ben said, gray activities. Unfortunately, you put that kind of thing in writing, you deliver it to some VC. It's on the record now. You're raising money for crime. It's never going to work in uh, jury situations. Bad for jury is bad for judges, bad for the Samurai wallet developers, unfortunately. Moving on to issue two, El Salvador again. President Bukele is back this week and he's making a great speech. He says that all the businessmen in El Salvador should lower their prices or else. He might even do to the businessmen what he did to the gang leaders, i.e. arrest them randomly in the streets without rights like every other dictator in history. 
We at this show are not surprised to see the dictator acting like a dictator. However, this came to a surprise to many libertarians who risked their lives, their futures, their money, and their reputations on the word of a random dictator who's, quite frankly, a little bit violent. And now, things are turning bad for them. Victoria Jones, what do you think about El Salvador, who they are now suddenly calling a communist? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, starting to arrest business owners for putting up their prices is a, cl a classic communist move and is definitely uh, incompatible with uh, the principles behind Bitcoin, which ultimately is designed to support uh, free market capitalism. So, yep, yeah, diametrically um, opposed. Uh, I would say it's a case of irresistible force meeting immovable object where the immovable object is slightly less immovable than the irresistible force. And so, of course, Bitcoin will inevitably win, surprising Bukele and uh, finally giving the libertarians uh, their modus operandi back again. <laughs> ben Ark, obviously we can't choose who uses Bitcoin, but they sure chose this guy. They chose to support him. And now he's speaking out against free enterprise and business. It's a real tricky one, and it's it's like the Chicago. I think we've said on the show before. It's like the Chicago Bulls, boy Bulls, the Chicago Boys, uh, Milton Friedman's Chicago Boys, um, who went out and uh, supported Pinochet um, in Chile. It's it, when there's a, a someone who is a bit a bit dictatory, and he starts to say things which you agree with, so whether you be a libertarian, whether you be a Bitcoiner, then if you just go and back them without being too skeptical, it can turn around to bite you as it did with Milton Friedman and, and his crew. Um, and it was always the worry with uh, Bacalli that he would do the same. It was a war zone, so we can't apply our own sort of sensitivities when it comes to the democratic process and all that sort of stuff and how people are incarcerated in that environment, because it was a war zone, it had the highest murder rate in the world after actual war zones. Um, and I met a guy on the plane coming back from El Salvador. It was like the third time that I'd been. And he, was, he wasn't even a Bitcoiner. Um, and I wondered whether I was just biased because, you know, I want the place to succeed because of the Bitcoin thing. But he was saying, no, it's safe now. Like his parents before were just terrified all the time and they wouldn't go out at night. And now they'll go out to restaurants and live a normal life. So there was a lot of good which happened. But obviously, the more heavy-handed you are, the more innocent people who will suffer. He did lock up political opponents. That's bad. He is now starting to do that thing which people do when they have a sniff of power is they want more power um, and they try and take control. And I just, it's, it's like a train wreck you're seeing in slow motion and decisions you're seeing being made. Um, and you just don't want it. What you want is him to now say, okay, I fixed the country. Let's have, a, you know, let's have a, um, an election, an actual fair election. Um, and I will, I'll stop incarcerating the political opponents. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. So it's, it's, it's kind of sad to see this thing, which you didn't want to happen like because you want it to work. You want uh, El Salvador to continue to grow and be, be prosperous. Um, so yeah, hopefully he'll turn around. But yeah, it doesn't look good. You start locking up business people. Well, it definitely seems once you start locking up people arbitrarily, you just can't stop. You know, first it was the gang members. Now it's going to be the bad businessmen. Who knows who it'll be next? Uh, I certainly hope for our, our friend of the show, Max Kaiser and Stacy who moved their entire operation to El Salvador, who blindly supported the dictator, as they've perhaps supported others on RT before in the past. And it didn't look good the whole time, and now it looks even worse. I'll have to see how it turns out. Vlad, what do you think about El Salvador and the dictator who suddenly is being called a communist? Well, you mentioned Max Kaiser and Stacy, and they're advisors to the president of El Salvador. And we do have to understand that these dictators are not almighty and competent in every possible field. And they do have a lot of advisors. And who is the economic advisor to the president of El Salvador? It's Seyfedin. <laughs> of all people in the world, it's Seyfedin, the, the author of the Bitcoin standard. Is he really? Mm. Well, maybe not domestic economics, but it's certainly Bitcoin economics. So Bikali wants to become a king, because that's what safety wants. He wants a monarchy, doesn't he? So maybe that's yeah, yeah, maybe. He? Yeah, he's a monarchist. Do you think so congratulations, monarchy? Bitcoiners, you enabled this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a mess the whole Thank time. Uh, I can't think of an exit question, but best of luck to the people of El Salvador. I hope it turns out. And once again, we're still waiting for that moment where we find out how many of their Bitcoin can fit into a suitcase. Spoiler alert. It's all of them. <laughs> Moving on to issue three, 
Colossal buying pressure for Bitcoin and Solana as FTX plans $16 billion distribution. The people who invested in FTX are getting, well, some of their money back and they might use it to buy Bitcoin, unlike the Mt. Goxers who were afraid after 10 years of forced hodling, maybe the FTXers will just jump right back into crypto. Ben Ark, what do you think about the possibility of the FTX users getting their money back and if they'll buy Bitcoin? Yeah, they may have been stung, but yeah, well, hopefully they'll buy Bitcoin. Yeah, why not? You know, but uh, f um, or that's, Solana, that's news, apparently, I guess. That's, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's good news, and I suppose that they're going to get the money back. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. I mean, I, honestly, I don't know enough about the story to even comment on it. To be honest, I I, I pay little attention. Is that Sam Bankman Fried? Is he? Have they killed him yet? Is he still alive? He's still alive he's in alive. prison. Looks oh, cool. like he's joined a gang and is oh. getting a lot more harder. He probably knows all the kind of abbreviations and hand signals and stuff. Whoa. So he'll join MS-13 and then end up in a Bikali <laughs> prison. I, mean, I think, again, it's an opportunity for him to advise them economically and perhaps they can make a nice amount on their, uh, their cryptocurrency holdings. Yeah. Uh, Vlad, what do you think about uh, L of, uh, FTX getting back their Bitcoin, the possibility that they'll reinvest? It's beautiful. It only took them a couple of years, as opposed to Mt. Gox, which is still going. We're, we're getting better and better at these bankruptcies. Each one we go through, better, better the next time. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can't deny, you know, it took the Japanese government 10 years. It took the American government two years. I mean, congratulations. There's a rare, rare support for the American government here. <laughs> yeah. I've been called a statist since I got my U.S. travel visa. <laughs> I got to double down on that because Seyfedean taught me that. You know, when you're wrong, you double down. Double down. <laughs> Very good. I read the Bitcoin standard, by the way. <laughs> you're the one. Let's go to Victoria Jones. What do you think about the FTX users getting their money back and if they'll reinvest? Well, if I remember correctly, wasn't it the case that when FTX collapsed, they didn't actually hold much Bitcoin? They hold, held like everything else apart from Bitcoin. I mean, the holders might have thought they were holding Bitcoin, but mm. of course, you know, most of their assets were um, backed by something else completely, mainly the FTX token that, um, you know, uh, what, was his, what was his name from Binance? Oh. Yeah, decided to, um, you know, scupper. Uh, via Twitter. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of shady stuff going on. I get the impression that um, a lot of the people who were investing were badly advised. I think Josh has said on the show that um, he's particularly scathing about the traditional financiers who were being advised to invest in FTX, who clearly didn't do their due diligence. Well, and, and remember, Sam Bankman's freed his giant head and his afro were on the cover of Fortune magazine. They were yeah. plastered across San Francisco, even on toilets and other municipal buildings. He was the whiz kid of Wall Street. He was, going, he was the one that was going to bring us regulated Bitcoin, regulated crypto exchanges. It was the next JP Morgan, right? And it was the exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. So ultimately, the people who were investing in FTX weren't actually the most knowledgeable or the most wise. So whether or not all the people who get their money back are then going to invest it into Bitcoin, I have no idea. And, consi and um, considering that the next thing on the traditional financiers' agenda is an Ethereum ETF, you know, I, I, I reckon that's where they'll put their money. So um, I wouldn't hold out too much hope for them buying Bitcoin. But you never know. <laughs> I think we should ask Matt Damon. I think we should ask Matt Damon what the FTX people will do because most of, the, of them invested because of that advertisement yeah. with Matt Damon, which said that fortune favors the bold. Mm -hmm. There was even a South Park episode about it. Oh, so much South Park about it. Um, Although the interesting thing, if they waited long enough, if they waited till now, everyone that invested on that commercial is in the profit now. It came back. Mm -hmm. So fortune favored the bold who operate on a long time span. Uh, but I definitely agree. As Seyfa Dean says, low time preference. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree with Vlad that we've gotten better at these things. It took 10 years for Mt. Gox, two years for this. The people might go back into crypto, whereas if you had your money in Mt. Gox for 10 years, you're going to be a little scarred by it. I think you're going to have a hard time reinvesting. Uh, let's keep moving. Let's move to issue four. God bless Bitcoin. A new movie and a new trailer about, a, about the title God bless Bitcoin. Uh, which I assumed would be based by Jimmy Song and his friend's uh, book of the same title. Uh, however, seems like a completely different documentary. Uh, when you play the trailer, you expect to see the usual faces of Bitcoin commentators. Instead, you're greeted by NBA player John Sally, famous NBA owner who criticized Bitcoin, Mark Cuban, 
and professional skateboarder Tony Hawk. Vlad, uh, Vlad Costa, what do you think about this new world of Bitcoin movies and Bitcoin trailers without any Bitcoiners in them? Well, that depends on how you define a Bitcoiner because Tony Hawk said he has been holding since 2013. Mark Cuban bought into, I think it was some DeFi stuff. and He did famously say on Rolling Stone that he would prefer to buy bananas, mm -hmm. that bananas were delicious and that they had an expiration date. And he had many economic reasons why one watching that video should invest in bananas instead of Bitcoin. But now he's an expert. You can trust him. <laughs> But don't forget that we're still early, right? Sure. I mean, we have these talking points that we used to present in bingo halls and places like this, just talks between nerds, and then you get a bunch of celebrities saying the exact same stuff, but in a dumbed down, <laughs> you know, in a way that appeals to the masses. I will not be, I'll try to be diplomatic. I sure. need to learn that. And yeah. It well, makes you I, wonder what's next. What, what's next for the next cycle? We used to have Elon pumping our bags and then crashing the price with just one tweet. And now we have these celebrities and now we have Trump of all people. Indeed. What's next? What's, what's going to happen in the next cycle? Some kind of emperor or something. But <laughs> it, it was surprising as I watched the trailer. I expected a lot more religious content. I expected more from the priest or the rabbi. Instead, I got the basketball player and the professional skateboarder. And they weren't saying religious things, which would have been fine if that's their own opinion and view. Like Vlad saying, they were repeating the exact same things we've said on our shows and Vlad says on his shows and his magazine and everything else for the last decade. But they were acting like they're brand new. Bitcoin democratizes society. Bitcoin provides access to all peoples. As if they just heard it yesterday and we haven't been saying it for a decade. So I was pretty disappointed in that. Uh, Victoria Jones, at the end of the trailer, David Bailey from Bitcoin Magazine, who owns all of the Bitcoin media, said that Bitcoin is the new money that will get money out of politics. Of course, he's also the one who got RFK Jr. into the race with more than a million dollars in donations and now has invited Trump to Nashville. So it seems a lot more like he's putting money into politics rather than taking it out. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with him. I think uh, Bitcoin does break politics, but I think he's also probably a realist and realizes that at the, mo at the moment we still work and live within a political system. And I think he's just taking advantage of that because ultimately the, pol the politicians are completely clueless about what they're getting themselves into. And uh, it's a classic case of... <laughs> Um, thinking that you can control something when it's actually uncontrollable and by the time you realize it's too late. <laughs> I'd also worry about the religious people. They say that for a rich man to enter heaven, it's like a camel fitting through the eye of a needle. So to hear the, the rabbi and other people going on in the video that Bitcoin, i.e. money or monetary power, is a new way to talk to God and a new way to communicate with the great one and so forth, I worry about that. I'm, I'm not sure that's what Jesus would say about money. It's more about feeding people, helping people, rather than uh, maybe collecting it all and getting a higher score and getting a, 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 fist, a faster line to the, the Almighty. Uh, ben Ark, what do you think about the new trailer and the new direction of Bitcoin documentaries that will not contain any Bitcoiners, no more nerds, celebrities only from now on, please? Yeah, so I suppose like debt-based money, so if you look at the Christian doctrine, usury is a sin. And it does make sense that non-debt-based money would be purer. Um, and I had an interview with Paco um, in Costa Rica. And uh, on, it's on the show. It's on, it's on WCN, on the World Bit, uh, Crypto Network, if you look through the videos. And in here, he articulates in the best non-cringy way that there is something pure about Bitcoin akin to gold. And he talks about how in India... Um, they appreciate gold because gold is pure like God. And he says it in such a way where it doesn't sound excruciatingly cringe. Um, and we all have that, I think. We all have this feeling that this thing has something pure to it. Um, so I can imagine that people, you know, through their religious lens, apply um, some morality to, to this new form of money which we have. Uh, I don't trust anything on the internet now, like with the AI stuff. Like I've seen, I just can't trust anything. So. I don't even know if Tony Hawk did that. Like, did he do that? Who knows? But the, whether they knew they were on like a, a religious-based video, Bitcoin promotion video, I'm not sure. 
Uh, but it is fun, like, watching these people say all the things we've been saying for, for, for years and years. And now they're all catching up. And to be honest, everyone will just forget who we are at some point and <laughs> they'll all just be coming out with this stuff and everyone will think they're these amazing innovators. And, um, but on David Bailey, we were talking earlier um, that he gets a lot of flack in our community for, I think, because he controls a lot of the media stuff. Um, he's very opinionated. Well, for, for the record, he had a, uh, an earlier Bitcoin magazine, something like Consensus or something like that. He purchased Bitcoin magazines started by Vitalik and the guys from BitPay. Then he purchased Let's Talk Bitcoin audio podcast network, which apparently they did nothing with and just threw in the corner. So a lot of purchasing. Yeah, a lot of purchasing. And he gets, anyway, he gets a lot of stick. But personally, he's only ever been good to me and very encouraging and nurturing too. When I first started making stuff, he like paid for me to go out to San Francisco and retrofit these arcade machines to accept lightning. And for him, it was kind of a gamble. And like no one like thanked him for it. You know, I was the one getting all the praise for retrofit. But it was him who like organized that. Um, and I know he did again the same with uh, Francis from from Changeable as well. And I think Vlad, you've had good experiences with Bailey, David Bailey as well. So I've had he is. Bad experiences with first and then. Yeah, I mean, in, in his own way, he's nurturing some bit like Bitcoiners. Um, in, in a way which is, he doesn't get praise for, no one really recognizes or acknowledges it. Uh, so I think he is a good guy. And um, with the whole Trump stuff, it, it, I'm conflicted. I'm going to Nashville. I'm going to have to sit and see Trump and all the MAGA hats and whatever else. But maybe David Blade, he's, maybe he's just deploying the Trojan, you know? He's like, I'll deploy the Trojan. I'll get this guy into Bitcoin and then we'll, in, in, like, we'll inject the thing which will ultimately destroy these evil uh, corporate politicians and whatever else. So, th anyway, whatever. David Bailey for me just gets a pass because uh, yeah, he's always been very good to me in the past, and he's a he's a good dude. <laughs> well, it, it certainly is a wonderful thing to have a major presidential candidate in the United States talking about Bitcoin. It's just unfortunate that it happens to be this one, and what he's promised to do uh, to our country. Oh, the, there's going to be two out of three, which I think is impressive. And I tweeted about this that ten years ago, a Bitcoin conference was about. Andres Antonopoulos and speaking to 10 people, maybe, sure. at best. And now you get two out of three presidential candidates from the United States yeah. going on stage at a Bitcoin conference saying, yeah, I like Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. I don't care about the particular politics. It's just the fact that they are there for Bitcoin. And because they, they got money from Bitcoiners, that's the point. They received a lot of donations for their campaigns. But we should not neglect the fact that the incumbent president tried to choke Bitcoin. I don't know how, how else I should put it. Yeah. He tried to destroy the entire industry, and he was ill-advised, maybe. And there are no signs that he's going to backpedal on it. I think they're going to double down and say it was Elizabeth Warren's campaign that she's building this army against crypto and they're going to overregulate everything. And it, I think a bunch of business people just said, okay, we're, we're not making the profits we expected. How do we stop this? And they saw, I guess, Trump or RFK as the only way in which they can possibly find some hope that these regulations are going to be removed. Yeah. It's, you know, po politicians want to get elected and businesses want to keep running. And they just... It's a mutual convenience here. It's, I don't think there's any ideological alignment. Yeah, and I think you, it's, it's also important to remember that politics is ultimately a popularity contest. You know, really a politician's job is to sense what the population wants and promise to give it to them in order to win an election. What they do after an election is often very different to what they promise before an election. And, you know, this is just par for the core. And even if Trump changes his mind um, after the election, because as you rightly say, you know, in 2017, uh, Trump was bragging about the fact that he popped the Bitcoin bubble. Even if he changes his mind and does something completely different afterwards, he's destroying his own reputation. And even in the process of fighting for Bitcoin during the election, he's raising the profile of this new asset in a way that no one else could really. So, you know, I think it's all for the good. Yeah, I do think that's important to note that Trump was very much against Bitcoin, publicly mocked Bitcoin, spoke against Bitcoin, lost his power now suddenly seems to pander to anybody, whether it's the Libertarian Convention, whether it's the Bitcoin Convention, and at the end of it, it's always the same story. 
They need money. He's got his hand out, and he wants your Bitcoin donations. And again, with the pardon issue, there was a lot of talk about him pardoning Ross Ulbricht at the end of his term. That's when pardons come. So if we were going to do that again, another four years from now, maybe he'll do it if he feels like it. The same thing for the economic policy. I just think you have to be very careful. You're making a deal with a politician, especially one that has kind of broken so many promises publicly over and over and over again. Uh, but let's keep moving. Let's move to issue five. Bitcoin price may hit $1 million by 2033, which is what we've been saying forever. Uh, ben Ark, what do you think about the possibility of Bitcoin breaking $1 million and uh, what people will do then? This is the only, the only price which matters. Oh, shit, sorry. The only price which matters is uh, 600 billion. It's 600 billion or, or get out, that's it. That's the price prediction. Um, anything lower than that is just FUD. So this is yet another FUD article on Bitcoin not achieving its goal of 600 billion per coin. I do think it's funny how every week we have a new commenter or financial analyst who's just woken up to Bitcoin. And like you say, they're all fighting to have the larger prediction. You said a million, I say 1.2. I say 1.25. You know, all this nonsense. Mad Bitcoins, of course, is already publicly predicted on the record infinity price for Bitcoin, meaning that the entire market will shift over and will start pricing everything in terms of Bitcoin, how much it's worth, whether it's the pyramids or the Louvre or lunch, price it in Bitcoin. Uh, so I do think we'll see that, but we'll see a lot more ridiculous predictions until then. Uh, Vlad Costa, what do you think about the possibility of Bitcoin hitting a million dollars by 2033? I mean, it sounds realistic. That's nine years from now. It's not out of the ordinary for Bitcoin to do something like that. But my question is, what's the price of food going to be when <laughs> one Bitcoin is one million dollars? Then a how much? A hamburger costs 100,000 Satoshis. <laughs> Still a good deal. I mean, it is 100,000 Satoshis today. So it worked out. If, if Bitcoin just adjusts to the inflation rate, I think that's pretty good. It, it's still a good performance. It beats most stocks, I guess. But at the same time, I don't know. It takes a lot of money to reach that. I don't know if people realize that we need, I think right now, a 6x from here to reach the market cap of gold. And that's still a huge achievement. And how much is that in terms of price? $300,000. And we need three times more to be able to go to, of course, of course, you have a limited supply. You can have a lot of people buying Bitcoins on exchanges for 1 million. And it doesn't actually take the liquidity mm -hmm. to be able to pump the price. But if you want everyone to be able to sell for that price, you need the volumes, you know. Mm -hmm. And we need a lot of volume. We need a lot of adoption. I guess we can repeat the same talking points right now. Maybe Tony Hawk is listening and we'll pick, pick them up and talk about it five years from now when we moved on and we're, we're more advanced, but he's preaching to the masses. I'm drunk. <laughs> uh, well, a million would be quite good, but like you say, Vlad, it would be almost impossible for everyone to sell at that and at the right time. And once it hits a million, everyone will be saying, it's going to go 1.2, it's going to go 1.5. I'm not going to sell a million, I'm going to hold. Uh, Victoria Jones, what do you think about the price possibilities of Bitcoin hitting a million by 2033? Yeah, well, my thought was the same, really. I mean, a lot depends on, you know, what the dollar will actually buy you uh, in, in, at that point in time. So it's the same kind of argument. I mean, it's really unknown. What we're really looking for is how much more widely Bitcoin is in circulation and basically how much more will one Bitcoin buy you? And there's always been a great cartoon about that, which is, you know, at one point, one Bitcoin would buy you, um, you know, not very much, maybe one can of beans. And then, you know, in a couple of years, you know, it was a whole trolley full of shopping. And now one Bitcoin, you know, could buy you, I don't know, you know, a a decent car and in, a, in yeah, the future, they like, one they Bitcoin. like to put a couple of baskets of groceries and then put a car behind it. Exactly. And it works really well. Exactly. So, 
that's what we're really looking for. We're really looking for it to be more widely cir circulated and for the Bitcoin you have to be able to buy, you know, more goods and services. And that's really the measure that we're looking for. So, you know, these numbers are a bit nonsense, really. And I think we get a bit fed up of hearing them. You know, what we really want is for people to be using it more often and therefore that's going to increase demand and Bitcoin will become more valuable. All right, let's keep moving. Let's move on to issue six. Unfortunately, we have to cover this. Uh, former President Trump is confirmed he's going to be at Bitcoin Nashville. He's going to speak on the, quote, future of the American Bitcoin industry at a crypto gathering this next month, unfortunately. Uh, we're all they're all supporting him kind of blindly, regardless of his other positions, which may cost people their rights, uh, their lives, the general freedom of the American democracy and so forth. Uh, but he's really famous and he's on TV a lot. So now they'll talk about Bitcoin. So everything is fine. Uh, ben Ark, what do you think about the Bitcoin Nashville convention and Trump's speech, the potential? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be there. Vlad's going to be there. And um, I'm very conflicted because, like we were saying, it's crazy this politician's talking about Bitcoin. That's incredible. And, and that they are impressions about this thing which we want to promote and we think will be a net positive for the world. Um, Trump himself isn't my kind of guy, you know. But I imagine there's lots of Bitcoiners, American Bitcoiners, who, who like Trump. Um, and for him, it's an easy win. He just goes and talks. You know, to, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to the Nashville conference, but many thousands, you know. So uh, for him, he could just stop in, and it's just like any other rally. Um, and he might get some new recruits. In fact, I imagine they'll be ecstatic, just the fact that there's a, you know, president-elect, whatever, um, talking about Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very, very, very conflicted. The thing I'm most conflicted over is uh, with Nostra, I really think we're going to get... So originally on the internet, f people gravitated towards forums and having interest-specific areas in which they could hang out with their mates, you know, so you're interested in golden retrievers or, I don't know, or um, Doctor Who. You would have a forum and then, you know, you'd be obsessed by this one thing and you would go and hang out with all your friends in that forum. And then the gravity of Twitter and Facebook and all these, like, big user networks pulled people out of those forums. And I think with Nostra, we can have the best of both. So you can have a subject-specific themed client yeah, it can still tap into the network of users just within Nostra. Anyway, the conflict, the why I'm conflicted is I think that you could probably easily onboard Trump onto something like Nostra if you just made like a MAGA client. So just got a client, put American flags and MAGA shit all over it, gave him a little area where could, you know, them as the people who are running that client could have a banner with some... I just think that... In, you know, when, when he got chucked off Twitter, if Nostra were a thing, I mean, if someone presented him with this client, then he would probably use it, and all the true social people would have gone there. So I'm very uh, conflicted. You do know he made, on paper, $5 billion off of his true social stuff. Oh, right, okay. Well, that's probably, so that's probably not the case. Yeah, He's okay, not okay, make okay, a similar okay, amount okay, off okay, of Nostra okay. stock. Unless... Anyway, that's why I was conflicted. It's like there's this guy talking about Bitcoin. He says a lot of... But it's the same thing. Getting him to talk about Nostra, getting him to talk about Bitcoin, it's a lot of press, but... Yeah, he's he's not a good person. <laughs> he's not my he's not my cup of tea. So, but yeah, it'll be it'll be it'll be, it'll be a spectacle um, and an interesting conference, I'm sure. Well, the polar opposite of uh, blockchain, we all could date. He's here. Most definitely, <laughs> a conference where you can talk to everyone versus a conference that's going to be very VIP and very controlled. And as we were saying on the last issue, while I've never met Tony Hawk. I did see John Sally at Bitcoin Miami, and he is very very tall. So he's definitely an NBA player. He's legit. I think, as Ben was saying, our only real hope on the Trump thing is that perhaps he communicates to his people the values of Bitcoin, the interest of Bitcoin. And, and while they are a, a very following type of people, I'm not sure if even he could follow them to Bitcoin, if he could lead them that way, and if that'd be successful. Of course, he's also said that he wants Bitcoin to be American and that he wants to mine 100% of it in America, which, of course, threaten censorship resistance and pretty much break everything Bitcoin's about. Uh, Vlad, what do you think about the former president speaking and, of course, his promise to Americanize Bitcoin, which I'm sure we all want? So try t to imagine this. It's going to be my first time in the U.S. <laughs> going to a Bitcoin conference, which I find out 
after I get my visa. So the next day after I get my visa, I find out that it's going to be a Trump rally in the last day. And I'm, I'm conflicted. I'm like, well, what did I sign up for? <laughs> On one hand, it's super interesting. I, I'm, I'm excited for it, just to see, to be there, to see what it's like. Because a lot of people say, oh, it was such a religious experience. It's what, it was like the Grateful Dead, you know, <laughs> going there and listening to Trump for two hours rant yeah. about stuff. I was thinking about other religions. I wouldn't bring any long knives or yellow stars. What? <laughs> World War II references. <laughs> they can look it up. <laughs> anyway, it's hilarious. I, I think it's interesting for someone who goes to the U.S. for the first time and ends up at a Trump rally. <laughs> I just wish you could see any other president than that one. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, Victoria Jones, what do you think about Trump uh, confirmed speaking at the Bitcoin convention? So when does the conference start? Is it? The 24th. Okay, yeah. so it's about a week away. Okay, and he's he's doing the rally at the end. Yeah, it sounds like it. Right. Okay. Well, of the panel here, I'm not going to be going to Nashville or uh, being uh, forced to to witness Trump. I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm actually pretty apolitical. Actually, I mean, I just I see the whole thing as a show and uh, fairly entertaining because I know Bitcoin is going to disrupt all of it. You know, I'm just uh, here to witness the show really and witness how it all plays out. And of course, Thomas is here recording it for a podcast prosperity. Uh, so I'm sure people will look back on this point in history and prosperity find... Prosperity or posterity? <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure people will be able to look back and analyze, uh, you know, exactly how these things played out and how people uh, witnessed it at the time. So, uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be watching it from the UK and uh, wish you both luck. <laughs> like most things, it would be better to experience from a long distance away like Europe. It's certainly going to be like one of those uh, talking heads, how did, how did I get here moments. You know, when I just stood there <laughs> amongst indeed, all the, yeah. in the Trump rally, I'd be like, how did I get here? <laughs> Oh, my Louisa room. <laughs> I don't know. But I'll be on the, the news. I'll be in the background behind Trump and everyone forever will be like, I saw Ben at a Trump rally. <laughs> That's right. On the other hand, we have to consider what this is going to mean for a Bitcoin conference because we're here, right? We can talk to everyone. We can go everywhere. We can do whatever we want. But if Trump comes here, of course, there's going to be security. There's going to be restrictions. There's going to be a VIP area. All things that libertarians another, like and support, right? Of course. Another <laughs> VIP area behind the VIP area. I don't know. A lot of security. Are there going to be registrations by the FBI? They Are have they to, going they to, have to keep him names, safe? They have to do whatever pictures. is necessary to protect the president, I'm sure. The Secret Service as well. Yeah. We'll yeah. It's not very safe for punk, right? I would wonder about heading into a room full of Bitcoiners. It's like going to a punk rock convention or something. It, can you trust all those punk rockers? I'm not so sure. Mm. But I hope he's fine. I hope everything's fine. I don't want anything to happen but to anybody. But it would be hilarious if Trump got on stage and not everyone, because I'm pretty sure that. Not everyone is going to act in the same way, but a lot of people left. <laughs> well, I remember at the Libertarian Convention, he did try to walk the room. At a certain point, he said, you only have 3%. What's wrong with you? Why don't you join me and get some power? You'll never get anywhere with your 3%, essentially mocking the Libertarians for the fact that their views are unpopular and they can't make a larger party. Um, he did recover. He did return to his presumably prepared notes, but uh, it was a, an unfortunate yeah, that speech. Was a, that was the Ross Ulbrich thing, wasn't it? He got like a five-minute standing ovation for saying he's going to free Ross Ulbrich. Of course. I mean, if you say what people want to hear, they generally clap. You, which you don't is, which, have to which actually is what happened in Nashville. Anything. He'll say everything we want to hear and everyone will clap. I'm afraid it'll be that way, and I'm afraid a lot of Bitcoiners, unfortunately, my friend Jesse Powell, of course, David Bailey, have all, and uh, the Winklevi twins, have already donated millions of dollars to this campaign. And it's one thing to maybe support him or maybe have him speak, but to put millions of your own money behind someone who might cause so much damage in other areas, but make your little pet cause more legal is just a dangerous trade-off. And I wonder in the future when there's graves and bodies everywhere, if you'll be like, well, you know, Bitcoin went up 10%. You know, this is fine. It's tough to say. But I think we got through that with very few World War II references, so let's keep moving. Uh, we're at the end of the show, so let's go to predictions or story of the week. Vlad, you're here in Majorca. Do you have a prediction or a story of the week? That's a good question. Do Maybe I have a read, read Bitcoin Takeover magazine. Tell the people where they can get it. Yeah, go to bitcoin 
No, is it Dash? Yeah, it's Dash. You better the know your own URL. Don't look at me. Dashtakeover.com <laughs> slash magazine, and you're going to find all three of my magazines. And I'm making one about Litecoin, which I'm going to launch at the Litecoin Summit. They were nice enough to finance everything, which no Bitcoiner... I mean, no. I, <laughs> I, I had sponsors for the Bitcoin ones, but the Bitcoiners didn't care as much. They, they were like, yeah, it's just another magazine. Fine. You can put it there on top of, look, I'm reading the Bitcoin standard by Saifedi. This is my new Bible. It's very smart. It, it presents arguments from history, which are modified and distorted to fit a narrative. And it says that there's this economist, you know, you shouldn't care too much about him. The entire world functions according to his ideas. But I'm telling you, he's very bad because he was a sexual deviant and he liked young girls in a time when that was socially evidence, acceptable. That's it's right. Evidence, exactly. So, yeah, no matter how much I struggle, people are going to read Saifedean. Yeah. And then he's going to advise the president of El Salvador. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it is unfortunate, Vlad, that people don't value your magazine. I think they confuse it with the fancy ones that are full of ads that are not a personal work, whereas your work is the work of an individual and your crew and your team. And I love that you work hard to make it and you put it out. It's good stuff. Well, it's fun. And my prediction is that I'm going to make a new one by the end of the year, and that's going to be called Bitcoin Year One, inspired by the comic book Batman Year One, which is a way to present the origins of something. It's not going to be like a comic book, but I do want to research a bit on the first users of Bitcoin Talk, the first developers who came to the project, the first transactions that were being made for real world objects or government money. I'm not going to call that real money. So yeah, I hope I'm going to finish that one. It's been in my mind for a while and I do want to get it out. It's just that I didn't have enough time because apparently I, I'm making a magazine about Litecoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Vlad. And I hope everyone can check that out at bitcoin-takeover.com. Yep. All right, very cool. Bitcoin Takeover Magazine. Victoria Jones, you have a prediction or a story of the week? Yes, well, my story of the week is uh, we're here in Mallorca Blockchain Days, a very uh, small Bitcoin conference with people who've been in the space for many years. And we often enjoy uh, catching up with each other annually. Um, if you go back on the World Crypto Network, you'll see that, you know, we had a very similar show uh, last year uh, where we were all here um, and, uh, yeah, having a great time. I'm going to be doing my talk tomorrow, which is going to be about Bitcoin and tulips, how they're similar but not the same. And actually, the focus of the talk is going to be how, uh, you know, we need to think about how uh, Bitcoin is not just about replicating the gold standard, but also the impact that it has on um, the way in which our legal system constructs our money and how Bitcoin disrupts that as well. And so um, the lectures at Mallorca Blockchain Days are being live streamed from their YouTube channel, Mallorca Blockchain Days. So if you're interested in watching that, then uh, you can maybe check that out. All right. Let's go to Ben Ark for a prediction or a story of the week. I mean, it, it, it really is. This is an incredible conference. It's like, it's very small. You know, it's under 100 people. And uh, yesterday, who turns up at the bar? Roger Ver. <laughs> Just turns up. He's not in prison. Why isn't he in prison? He just turns up at the bar and he's like, oh, hey, guys. And then who turns up this evening? Amir Taki. And then he's like, oh, do you want to go for a swim tomorrow in the morning? I'm thinking, Amir. Um, so it's such a wow. And you've got Graham, the guy who invented, I can't remember his second name, the economist who invented quantitative easing is here. Uh, Mad Bitcoins is here. It's literally the craziest conference for such a small <laughs> gathering of people. It's so... Like, I don't know, like, it's just, yeah, it's just a, a great group of Bitcoiners. Um, and uh, I'm sure your talk will be amazing, by the way. I love your talk. So they're, they're, they're so well put together and so well organized. I'm always quite jealous of your, your delivery. I need to take a leaf out of your book. So, yeah, it's, it's a Bitcoin Mallorca. Phenomenal. Um, honestly, next year, turn up and you'll get to swim in the sea with Amir, hang out with Roger. For, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's good times. Um, so that's the story. It's just that, really, the Mallorca conference. I definitely agree. I agree with the whole panel. It's great to be here in Majorca. Thanks to Chris and Andre and Bastian and the rest of the people that work here, Mike and Alyssa and everyone that works on the convention and makes us feel welcome here and all the free drinks and the free dinner and all the stuff that you get when you join a nice conference like this. So 
It is great. We'll have to see what happens with this whole Bitcoin conference in Nashville. I guess I'll be watching on the YouTubes. Hopefully they'll uh, live stream it and uh, we'll see what happens. I'll get a Trump interview for WCN. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great. Yeah, go, go get it, man. We'll, we'll put it up. You know, Time Magazine had that guy as a man of the year one time. So, you know, anything can happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, just thanks to everybody for watching the show. Sorry that we didn't do it at the correct time today. Uh, we're going to upload this video later. The internet here is not great, so I'm not sure if the upload is going to succeed when I try it. So it might be a multi-step process, which would slow us down. But if you made, us this, made it this far in the show, give us a thumbs up. Maybe give us a wave or a surfing emoji in the chat or uh, in the comments down below. We didn't have any comments last week, so we could use some this week. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for subscribing and supporting us all the time. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>